Behind the Attic Wall by Sylvia Cassidy, Chapter 26. And we start with the title on a school paper. Margaret Ann Turner, Grade 6, Room 8, April 19th. The Rose. The rose is a plant that grows on a, on a vine. It contains blossoms, buds, leaves, roots, and thorns. The blossom part is a gypsy dancer that throws its red silk scarves in the air. The bud is a gypsy baby that's all wrapped up tight in little scraps. Pretty soon it will kick its way out and wave its scarves around too. Sometimes you can hear it cry. The leaves are the gypsy's castanets that shake in the wind. The rose swallows water through its roots, which are the throat of the plant. The best part is the thorns. The thorns are for catching the silk scarves on so they won't blow away. Maggie stared at the reports that lay on her desk. A scattering of red question marks dotted the page, like a shower of tiny seahorses, and a red U, neat and stiff, stood at the bottom like a toy pail ready to receive them. U, in her old school, and the one before that, U, stood for unsatisfactory. Here it meant unacceptable, but it was still the lowest grade you could get. You didn't follow the proper for procedure for writing a nature report, Miss Hunter had written across the top. What are your references? Where is your bibliography? See me! Maggie's desk lid lay partially open, and under it she worked a pair of scissors around a scrap of lace she had found at the bottom of the remainder box in her classroom cupboard. At the bottom of the remnant box in her classroom cupboard. She let the loose threads fall across her report on the rose. The lace had come from the border of a window curtain, maybe an old petticoat, or maybe an old petticoat. It was woven with little lilies of the valley and tiny rosebuds and it was exactly right for a shawl for Miss Christabel to wear to the party. The party had been Maggie's idea. Don't you ever do anything special around here? she had asked the dolls once. I mean, don't you ever have Thanksgiving or Christmas or anything? Don't you have birthdays? Birthdays, Timothy John replied. But we wouldn't know what they were. We don't have years, you know. There's no way of telling when they've gone by. Maggie had thought about that then. Without a calendar... Without any contact with the world outside, how would they know when a birthday came or went? You can't have you can't have years, Timothy John had gone on, unless you have things that change with them, flowers that bloom and die and bloom again, and animals that grow longer in the leg. It was true, nothing changed in the attic. The roses clung in eternal bloom to their paper vine. Juniper remained forever the size of Maggie's thumb. The news in Timothy John's paper told the same fiery event and the world outside the window could be viewed only with the aid of a chair. "'We could make it a special day,' Maggie had said, "'and I could tell you when it came each year. "'We could have a party, and it could be like our own special day "'that nobody would know about. "'What day? It had been March then. "'All the holidays had gone by. "'Her own birthday had gone by, "'along with two other girls whose birthday fell on the same month. "'She had been given a calendar in school one day at lunchtime, "'and there had been cupcakes.' with candles for dessert instead of stewed fruit. We could celebrate the day you first came here, she had suggested. May 14th, it could be your birthday for both of you, or an anniversary. And for Juniper, too, we could have a party with presents, and I could bring cake, and we could put ribbons around the table. Maggie had never been to a real birthday party, and she made up what she could remember, what she could from remembering scenes in books. We could have it every year. Could we do that? Timothy John and Miss Christabel had, co had cocked their head toward each other and remained that way for a long time. But birthdays are what make people grow older, Timothy John said. If we have birthdays, we'll get wrinkles. You already have wrinkles, you already have wrinkles Miss Christabel answered, especially in your jacket. You'll only get older once a year, Maggie told them. That's true, Timothy John said. The rest of the time we'll stay the same. A party, Miss Christabel exclaimed. We'll have to shine the kettle. Maggie moved her scissors in and out among the edges of the lace, folding and smoothing it until it was just the right shape, narrow at the top and wide at the bottom. In the front of the room, Miss Hunter was filling the blackboard with long division brackets. Houses, she called them. The dividend is inside the house under the roof, she was saying. The quotient is on top of the roof, and the divisor waits at the door. Maggie lifted her eyes from the lace and looked around at her classmates. Carolyn was extracting a thick wad of paper strips from the tunnel of her spiral notebook. Alyssa had drawn a large A on the edge of her sneaker sole and was now inking it in with stripes and circles. Gregory was crushing the point of his pencil between the teeth of his loose-leaf rings. 
Sharon was peeling a continuous snake of paper from her crayon. Maggie held the piece of lace up in front up in front of her eyes and peered through its spidery threads. Everything in the room suddenly took on a network of cracks as she moved her head behind the lace, the floor, the windows, the walls, and each of the faces around her. She returned the little shawl to the well of her desk and smoothed it out, tracing with her fingernail the, fra the frail network of blossom and leaf, imagining Miss Christabel's face surrounded by its folds. They would be all they would all be in the garden the day of the party, Miss Christabel against the wallpaper roses, and Timothy John at her side. He would be wearing a new ribbon around his neck, one that Maggie was going to make from the fringe of the drapery in the parlor, and he would be holding Juniper. There would be something new for Juniper, too, but she hadn't decided what. Best of all would be the present she was saving as a surprise. It would be back in the little room, and it was the most wonderful present ever. What a lovely shawl, Miss Christabel would say, and she would draw the lace around her shoulders. Yes, and here's something else, Maggie would answer, a clasp of gold to keep it from sliding off your shoulders, and she would fasten the shawl with a little brass tack she had just discovered in the corner of her desk. It's all gold, and right now she slipped its slender wings between the two openings of the, in the lace design and held it again to see how it looked in the light. Suddenly, she sensed, she sensed a change in the room, and in another moment she noticed the stillness. Miss Hunter was still, the chalk was still, the pens and pencils and the pens and pencils and crayons were still. Nothing stirred. Maggie lowered her desk lid and looked around. Everything was like a photograph. Miss Hunter stood frozen in front of the room, her eyes fixed on Maggie. All the other faces shattered only a moment into tangles of lacy cur into a tangles of lacy cracks were now smooth and whole and turned too toward Maggie. Hurriedly, she returned the scrap of cloth to her desk and folded her hands on the lid, keeping her eyes fastened all the while on the blackboard with its powdery patterns of brackets and numbers. Well, Miss Hunter seemed to be waiting for an answer. Maggie looked up at her. An answer to what? Where is your work? Miss Hunter was moving down the aisle now. What work? For a minute, Maggie had thought she was referring to the lace. She looked around. A notebook lay on every desk but hers. Apparently, math was over and they had moved on to something else. She opened her desk lid to extract her own notebook, but a hand shot ahead of hers. And the next moment, Miss Hunter was crushing Miss Christabel's shawl into a tight wad and marching with it to the corner of the room, where she held it above the waste basket and finally let it drop upon a bed of silvery pencil shavings and chalk stubs. Here, I got this for you. It was the end of the day, and they were getting their coats from the hooks in the corridor. Barbara was standing next to her, holding something in her hand. What's it for, anyway? Maggie looked into Barbara's open palm and saw the little scrap of lace crumpled now like a used paper doily and smudged here and there with gray. Maggie put her arms into her sleeves, into the sleeves of her coat, and began to button up. It's nothing, she said. I don't want it. It's just an old piece of rag. Barbara examined it. Can I have it? Yeah, sure, I don't care. It's just an old rag. What were you doing with it, then? Nothing. Just messing. But I saw you cutting it out, like you were making something. What were you making? Maggie finally looked up at Barbara's face. There was no mockery there. Nothing, in fact, but curiosity. What were you making? Barbara repeated. Everyone else in the class had moved down the hall, and Barbara and Maggie were alone in front of the coat hooks. A shawl, Maggie finally said. A shawl? For who? For this lady, I know. You mean the lady you told about it sharing with the roses and all? Yeah, her. Then how come it's so small? Maggie looked back at Miss Christabel's lace lying twisted in Barbara's palm, and she suddenly wanted it back. I mean, it's for her doll, she said, and her hand darted out like a diving bird snatching a scrap of cloth away. She stuffed it into her pocket and began edging down the hall to keep Barbara from grabbing it back again. Oh, is it a costume doll? Barbara asked, following her. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sort of, yeah. They were side by side now, walking down the stairs together, and Maggie tried to see herself through someone else's eyes. Maggie and another girl walked downstairs together, talking like other people, like friends. What country? What country? Yeah, is it from Holland or Poland or what? Is what from Holland? The costume doll. Oh, Maggie thought it's from around here. Then what's so special about it? What was so special about Miss Christabel? Miss Christabel. She was herself. That's what. She was real. She and Timothy John lived in this wonderful place in the attic that nobody else in the whole world knew about. A wonderful place where it was warm and happy and they, what? They liked her a whole lot and she liked them. Loved. So what's so special about it? Barbara asked again. 
Nothing. She just has these old-fashioned clothes. Can I see her? Could she see her? See Miss Christabel? See Timothy, John, and Juniper? What would that be like? Maggie wondered. These are the dolls, she would say, leading Barbara into the hidden room in the attic. This one's name is Miss Christabel, and this one's name is Timothy John, and this is supposed to be their dog. His name is Juniper, and Barbara would say, Oh, can we dress them in different clothes? And then all of a sudden, Miss Christabel would rise from the table and start bringing in extra dishes from the china cupboard, And while Timothy John would read aloud from his newspaper, and Juniper would growl from under the table. Can I see it or not? Barbara asked. No, it's this lady's, and she doesn't let anyone touch it except me. Everything she had said made less sense than before. Not even to look at? No, they were down at the front door by now. I have some costume dolls you can look at, Barbara said. You want to see them, see them sometime at my house? Maggie looked up. No one had ever invited her to visit before. No one, ever. I, I don't know, she said. Maybe. And that's the end of chapter 26.